Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to try to put my father's persecution in a context to show the continuity between then and now. Um, I can speak with some authority because uh, I've also been a target of both COINTELPRO and MKUltra. Uh, been more fortunate than most. I'm still here and healthy. Most people who have had that experience are no longer with us. Um, in terms of a context, the people who did that to my father and to me are part of what I call the permanent government. They have been here since before the Civil War. They were responsible for the assassination of Lincoln, of Kennedy, and many, many more. They have been responsible for starting wars, for covert operations that have tried to start wars. They have been involved in assassinations of foreign uh, diplomats and heads of state, and on and on and on. Contrary to the mythology, the most important part of that secret government is run out of a secret operation in the defense department, out of defense intelligence, which gets 80% of the budget. That's where the ball game is. That's why the 9-11 Commission focused on a czar who would extract the budget and control from the defense department. The CIA is small stuff. However, they're coordinated, and um, the Real dirty work is done by something called the Field Operations Unit of Military Intelligence. Now, those people are around because they come from a special segment of the American population since before the Civil War. They belong to a specific ethnic group and a regional group they are part of an elite in this country that used to call itself the WASP Ascendancy. The <coughs> ethnic designation is English and German, otherwise known as Anglo-Saxon. They used to call themselves WASPs, but that's no longer in vogue. Uh, they have a predominantly southern center of gravity, wealthy, and fundamentalist Protestant. WASP stands for White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Since Anglo-Saxons are already white, that's double white Protestant, meaning super white. They are the cousins, if not the brothers, in constituency and culture of Hitler's Nazis out of southern Germany, specifically down around Bavaria and Austria. That's where Hitler came from. That's the core of the Nazi tradition. And the cultures and outlooks of the tradition of Hitler in Germany and the Confederacy in the United States are almost identical. And if you read Mein Kampf, you will read Hitler's compliments to, you know, if the Americans get their stuff together and go Confederate-wise, they'll be just like us. Now, it's hidden, and nobody talks about ethnicity in this country for that very reason. They were the core of the slave owners. And let's say I have a special bias against them because I happen to be the grandson of not just a slave, but a field slave. And that's some difference between a freedman and a house slave and a skilled slave. So that struggle has been going on for generations. And America has always been two, not one. That's what John Edwards is talking about, two Americas. One America is simply enough, the tradition of the Confederacy. The other is the tradition of the Union. Now, both of them are led by was one Lincoln, and one's Jefferson Davis. Difference night and day. The progressive America is Lincoln, Roosevelt, Kennedy. The reactionary America is Jefferson Davis, Ronald Reagan, and Bush one and two. 
especially two. <laughs> Anglo-Saxon, okay, Southern, in Bush's case sort of transferred from north to south, but Southern core, fundamentalist Protestant, and wealthy. Slave owners updated, and what you're looking at is something like a neo-confederacy. That's what's going on. Now my father, the son of a field slave, fought that America to the death from day one. And, well, I try to continue with that tradition. That is the enemy, capital E. Either one America or the other will triumph in the end. That's what the Civil War is about, and it's still going on. This crisis is similar to the Civil War and other crises between the two Americas. And it's choose-up time. That's what is happening. Now, my father was point man for the progressive America. Anti-war, opposed three of them. Cold War, Korean War, Vietnam War. He's talking about, I'm looking for freedom, full freedom. Now, not an inferior brand. Either or. There's no such thing as half free. And secondly, to add to culture and race, the issue of class. Yeah, I'm for the meek inherit the earth means they take it. And right now, class is big time, in case you hadn't noticed, although you can't say that you say working families, but don't you dare say working class or you can't get elected dog catcher because you're some kind of socialist, communist, or whatever. However, this country is two Americas, 80% below $75,000 a year and 20% above $75,000 a year. Well, that's the issue. The country's now run for the top 20%, actually the top 10 or so, 15, blacks included, and other 80% later for them. Well, the 80% time has come, and that's a big issue among black folks. So you're talking about class, race, and culture all together. You can't leave any of them out. And the fourth leg of the chair is peace. Because if you got some liberals running around, well, they're Cold War liberals. Well, we'll do guns and butter. We got to fight either communism or terrorism or whatever abroad and establish some kind of empire. They're going to deep six everything progressive. No, you can't have progressive domestic policy and a, a warlike or imperial foreign policy and have a decent anything at home and you don't believe it, look what Truman did with his, he started the Cold War, and Johnson, the war on poverty, turned out to be a kind of a half measure because black folks, minorities, poor folks were not in power. It was against that background that for centuries they've gone after the progressives. And by progress, I mean, let's say Tom Paine, who said against slavery, et cetera, et cetera. Now Jefferson's a slave owner, so that's a big difference. So read Tom Paine and then read the Declaration of Independence and you'll see the difference. The difference. So my father, 40, 50 years ago, is way out on the progressive side, point man. So he was lucky to survive at all. Now they began going after him under Cointelpro, that's the FBI, under a progressive president, Roosevelt, who even with all his power couldn't get rid of Hoover. Hoover more or less did what he wanted, law or no law. So he started going after dead when he was at the height of po his popularity in the 1940s. Ballot for Americans, Bard of Liberty, Herald of Freedom, Othello, all American. I mean, he was everything. They called him America's number one Negro, whatever that's worth. In any case, guest at the White House, all this. Hoover busy, not only surveillance, but bugged his apartment, bugged his phone, on and on, followed him around, etc. This is 1940s. Come 1946, there's a Cold War, 
And Dad has nerve enough to go down to Washington, D.C., by the way, co-chairman of the campaign for the uh, crusade against lynching was Albert Einstein, no less. So they go down to ask Truman and lynching. Oh, no, Truman said, I can't do that because it's a political issue, the time isn't right, and so on. Well, that's saying it's a moral issue. And by the way, Mr. President, I must say, if the federal government can't protect black folks in the South, maybe uh, veterans down there will have to defend themselves. Then you'll have to send federal troops there. Uh, Truman jumps up, shakes his finger. That sounds like a threat. He's all red in the face. And Dad, all six feet three, 240 pounds, still athletic, slowly gets up from his seat. And the Secret Service men on either side, either side of the president's desk, they jump out to the side of the desk, open up the jackets, show the 45. And Dad's just standing there. And somebody in the delegation other than that said, well, we meant no, no uh, threat to the president. And Dad said, of course not. Uh, I meant no d disrespect to the office of the presidency. I just was expressing how black folks who are 10% of the population feel. So Truman spotted, okay, this meeting's over. So this is headline. Robeson and Truman go at it. And from the Freedom of Information Act documents I got, is right after that meeting, President Truman calls in General Vaughn, who's his military aide, and says, uh, this Robeson fella, uh, he's getting to be kind of a problem. Why don't you, why don't you tell J. Edgar Hoover to kind of keep tabs on him? Now that means Hoover has license to to help the president solve his problem. And we know what that is. Well, by some coincidence, this is 46, right after that, that's called by the House on American Activities Committee. He tells them to go, well, I won't quote it, but he was a lawyer, so he wound him around his finger. But in the meantime, suddenly he's picketing after a concert, he picketed a segregated uh, movie theater in St. Louis. And on the way to another town with a friend of his, the left front wheel of the car comes off on the highway. Well, fortunately, they weren't going too fast. And nothing happened. But if you're going fast and the left wheel comes off, you swerve into the oncoming traffic. You are very dead. <coughs> And that happens to be a signature of the FBI. Their hits are by retired FBI people who, some of whom, they have this way you sabotage, oh, it's easy to sabotage the wheel. You loosen up the, the things so that the, the wheel comes off when the, when the speed comes up. Um, and then in the 1950s, there were two more such incidents, of course, that's no longer under Truman, that's under Eisenhower, who's a liberal Republican. Well, if you recall, he says, watch out for the military industrial complex. He's talking about these people whom he ha can't control. Okay, so flash forward to Kennedy. There's the first Irish Catholic to ever be president, and he's talking about, if you read his inaugural address carefully, he's talking about peace say the real enemy is disease, poverty, and war itself. So he's talking about ending the Cold War. And on top of that, he says there's a line in which he says a free nation that cannot protect its rich, that, that cannot help its poor, cannot save its rich. Well, that was his death mark. I mean, especially Irish Catholic can't do that. Okay. So this is the people that uh, did the following to my father. This MK Ultra now, because Cointelpro didn't work. That was all kinds of psychological warfare and so on. That just didn't work. They tried to discredit him by spreading lies about him, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I don't go into the details of that. That's going to be in my second volume. But they decided they needed to do, let's say, a little more effective neutralization measures. So there's a program called MKUltra, 
where the CIA developed under Helms and Alan Dulles a program for using a special drug, later known as LSD, hallucinogenic drug, which if you drop a little and, and um, give somebody a Mickey Finn with that, the, re the reaction, chemical reaction is such that extreme depression and uh, people get so depressed and frightened and whatnot, they usually commit suicide. And then, of course, they had a depression, terrible, you know. Well, there was an incident in 1961. My father was abroad. He'd gotten his passport, couldn't travel to China and elsewhere, like Cuba and uh, China and a couple of other countries. He had never been to Africa. He wanted to go there. So he, since he's under surveillance in London, decided, well, he'd been abroad four or five years, time to go home and join the civil rights movement, so he's going to violate the passport regulations, go to Africa and then China. And on the way back, Fidel Castro had invited him to drop it at Havana, so he decided he'd do that. The problem was he couldn't do that from London too well, because not only the CIA and military intelligence, but London's the British MI6 is something like these American people. That's under Tony Blair these days. He's brought them back big time, um, even though he's a labor person. But in any case, Dad wisely says, well, I'll go to Moscow and take off from there. Problem was that it was a few weeks before the Bay of Pigs. So these characters thinking, well, if we hit the beaches and Robeson sitting in Havana with Castro, it's not too good. So since Robeson's in Moscow anyway, uh, what better place to take him out than in Moscow? Then Egg will be on the face of the KGB besides. Nobody will believe that. So essentially, that's what happened. There was a party in his quarters, and somebody gave him a Mickey Finn. He slashed his wrists, but not somehow he didn't uh, do it enough. They caught him early, and by the time my mother and I got there, he was fine. I mean, not fine, but he was in pretty good shape. He recovered, and the Soviet doctors wisely said the best place for him is at home in Harlem among his own people because, strangely enough, they will hit him there if he's wandering around abroad. He's asking for it. So Dad, I have three minutes, so I'll, I'll wind up. Dad made the mistake of going back to London and pick up his things. And I made the mistake of uh, on my own, because I was young and stupid then, decided I'm going to investigate on my own what happened to Dad, which they warned me is strange times. Don't do that. Oh, I'm big and bad. Anyway, something similar happened to me, but I was fortunate I walked away from it. But then I couldn't take him home. So they hit him in London again, and he wound up in a London psychiatric hospital, where, under a program which is an extension of MK Ultra, their MI6 British colleagues arranged for him to get 54 electroshock treatments in a hurry. That's enough to knock out an elephant, but he still had enough left to really make a pretty good recovery when he came home, was starting to get back into public life when he got hit again. And that was it was enough not to knock him out entirely. But that was his retirement. And he decided, well, uh, he was not going to be in public in that shape. Let him remember me the way I, I am. And he suffered for, well, maybe 15 years in that shape and gritted his teeth, never complained. Well, his legacy is important because the same people around now doing the same tricks from 9-11 to New Orleans. That's why the folks are staying there, because the idea is the way you get rid of the poor, especially in the ghetto, is called ghetto removal. 
that's what's going on. So it is choose up time, and my time is up, so uh, we'll leave the rest of the question period. But I would say what happened then is happening now in a different guise, and what we need is to decide and make clear who the enemy is and fight them like we did in the Civil War in the 1930s and mm. in the 1960s. This time, let's pick up where Martin left off, Memphis and the Poor People's Campaign this time. And among right. our own folks, it's time to choose up who's going to bell the cat and who isn't, and especially who serves the enemy. We should not allow our folks to do that politically. 